Hi, Princess. Hi, Lindsay. So, uh, have you ever done the fan fiction before? Yes, many moons ago. Oh, yeah? <laughs> what was the first fandom you ever wrote for? Uh, Avatar, The Last Airbender. Zutara lives on forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what about you? Phantom. <laughs> Phantom of the Opera? Like, not the Billy Zane Phantom, <laughs> the uh, the bad one, the problematic one. So on a scale from disappointed to disheartened, how deep is your shame? My shame? Um, pretty deep. How about you? Um, you know, sometimes I feel shamed, but other times I'm like, you know what? I like my trash. Hmm. And that is what we are. Trash. <laughs> <laughs> Our relationship to fanfic as a concept has changed, but not just fans' relationship to it. The professional publishing world also has a wildly different relationship to fanfic, even from like 10 years ago. So what has caused this shift, and what does that change even look like? Part of the human fascination with narrative is a desire to expand on the stories we hear. One popular narrative is the story of the trickster hero. Like in the American South, we have the Jack tale about a guy named Jack. Or in the Black Diaspora, we have the Spider God character, Anansi. These characters have no original author, but over the years have gained popularity in their communities through oral traditions. But the modern concept of copyright complicates our relationship to characters and narratives, which are no longer the intellectual property of a culture, they're the IP of a person or a company. Fan fiction website Archive of Our Own who I lost a Hugo to last year, co-founder Francesca Coppa defines it simply as creative material featuring characters from works whose copyright is held by others. There's kind of an unspoken understanding that you aren't supposed to make money off of fan fiction, which is part of why copyright holders usually let it slide. And as a result, it kind of exists in this legal gray area. Most IP owners let it exist, and some even encourage it because it facilitates a good relationship with fans. But for me, what's really interesting about fan fiction is the negative connotations that have sort of dogged it over the last few decades that fan fiction is embarrassing, that it's neither real writing nor a good writing exercise, that it is something to be relegated to the daydreams of preteen girls. But not only that, professional authors' relationship to fan fiction has changed. Many authors began as fan fiction writers and are kind of out and proud about that now. Some continue to write it for fun, and sometimes they just swap out the names of the copyrighted characters and publish their fanfic as original fiction. Where fan fiction used to be seen as a joke, writers today have been coming out of the closet, so to speak, about their own history with fan fiction and how it helped them form their professional careers. That's right, we have Hugo and Nebula winning fanfic authors now. Some history. What we know as fan fiction has its roots not on the internet, but in fanzines, specifically science fiction fanzines from the early 20th century, which actually published fan fiction at the time. To Harvard English professor and writer Dr. Stephanie Burt, fan fiction is a phenomenon that has always existed in some form or other as a way for fans to meaningfully interact with the media they liked. Says Burt, first there were fans of science fiction novels and magazines who held conventions and traded self-published journals as early as the 1930s. Or first there was Sherlock Holmes, whose devotees hooked by serial publication pushed for more stories, formed clubs, and wrote their own. Some say that fan fiction itself isn't writing, that real writers don't participate in it. That if you want to write, you have to have original stories. You know, like James Joyce and William Shakespeare and Dante and Salman Rushdie. Says Burt again, no clearer path from new writers to potentially interested readers has existed in the history of civilization. Not all stories are stories that other people will seek out. If you can work your memories, hypotheses, or fantasies about living away from home, or gender transition, or about retirement into a story about Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson, maybe the many people who care about Batman and Robin will care about your thoughts and experiences too. This challenges the idea that fan fiction is the toy of the creatively bereft, that the only good fiction is writing that's 100% original. Why, for example, is John Milton's Paradise Lost or James Joyce's Ulysses canon without ever questioning their originality, even though they're just retellings of the Bible and the Odyssey, respectively? Well, part of it is copyright jankiness. Ulysses and Paradise Lost are based on stories that were never copyrighted because copyright was not a thing in Homer's time. We have a wholly different relationship to copyright now than James Joyce and John Milton did, but that can't be all of it. Ever since modern fan fiction gained popularity in fanzines, particularly Star Trek fanzines, it's predominantly been the wheelhouse of women. 
Best-selling author and Hugo winner Seanan McGuire sees the phenomenon as partially a response to a lack of female-oriented storytelling in mainstream and published mediums. In her essay, The Bodies of the Girls Who Made Me, Fan Fiction in the Modern World, she writes, Everyone who grows up on a diet of Western media learns, on some level, to accept the default as their avatar, because we historically haven't had much choice. Want to be the hero instead of the love interest, the scrappy sidekick, or the villain? Embrace the default. Learn to have empathy with the default. He's what you get. We stopped writing about ourselves and started writing avatars, characters who could represent us in the stories without quite being us. It's no coincidence that a large part of the fanfiction community has been built by women, POC, and LGBTQ writers in a professional publishing world that has only relatively recently begun to represent them. Fanfiction is having something of a reckoning over the last few years. Writers like Seanan McGuire or N.K. Jemisin, successful authors who are vocal proponents of what fanfiction has meant to them as creative minds or websites like Archive of Our Own, creating a living documentation of fanfiction's vast community while advocating for free speech. Or academics like Francesca Coppa, publishing both commercial fanfiction and research on the subject. Star Trek fandom was the starting point for many science fiction professional writers. Jacqueline Lichtenberg was an early Star Trek fanfic writer. She went on to publish her own fantasy series, starting in 1974. And Lois McMaster Bejold, one of the most prolific and beloved science fiction writers still writing today and writer of the Vorkosigan saga, also dabbled in Trek fanworks early in her career. But these are early examples of professional authors getting their start in fanworks, which is not the same thing as repackaging your fanfiction as original fiction and then publishing it. When fictional fan works are rewritten and sold as profic, the fanish code for this is filing off the serial numbers. Fifty Shades of Grey, which originated as Twilight fanfiction, might be the cliché of fanfiction reworked for publication, but it's actually been a thing for a while. There are a few obscure incidences from the olden times. For instance, in 1985, author Terry White published a Starsky and Hutch fanfic as Cowboy Blues. And in 1997, author Susan Matthews reworked her Star Wars fanfics into An Exchange of Hostages and the Jurisdiction series. You love to see it. But since the 2000s, perhaps in no small part because publishers have taken note of fanfic authors who already have big followings of their own, it's gone from anomaly to actual trend. Cassandra Clare was a Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings BNF, which for those not in the fandom parlance know means big name fan. She became hugely popular in Harry Potter fandom for her Draco trilogy, much of which was reworked into her best-selling Mortal Instruments series. And a shocking amount of one fanfic subgenre called RPF, which means real person fic, which is exactly what it sounds like, has been reworked for publication. Probably because you can't really like copyright a person, so there's a lot less copyright jank there. You can just write about a real person and pretend it's a fictional character. After is the most famous example of this, reworked from the fanfic of the same name about a college alternate universe, or AU, featuring Harry Styles from One Direction as a bad Harry Styles. But there's a truly staggering amount of One Direction fanfic that has had its serial numbers filed off for publication. So not only are some authors permissive of fanfiction, even starting their careers as fanfic writers before making the transition, some just cut out the middleman and publish their slightly reworked fanfiction as original fiction. J.K. Rowling has been generally supportive of fanfiction, but not all authors have such a benign relationship to the concept of fanfiction. Authors who aren't so keen on fanfic rage from the mildly disapproving, like Uncle George R. R. Martin, who said, My characters are my children. I don't want people making off with them, thank you. Even people who say they love my children. I'm sure it's true, I don't doubt the sincerity of the affection, but still. No one gets to abuse the people of Westeros but me. And the writers of Game of Thrones. And that brings us to Vampire Chronicles author Anne Rice, who was once very hardcore with the whole cease and desist letter thing, to the point where pretty much the entirety of Vampire Chronicles fanfiction throughout the 90s and 2000s existed on lockdown live journal groups, with some fans even claiming to have been harassed by Rice's lawyers. The characters are copyrighted. It upsets me terribly to even think about fanfiction with my characters. I advise my readers to write your own original stories with your own characters. It is absolutely essential that you respect my wishes. <laughs> yeah, that's my, that's my Anne Rice voice. Although, to her credit, she has mellowed out a little since then. Even pro authors like Sean and McGuire, who continue to write fanfic themselves, would prefer that you don't send your own to them, because it can muddy the waters of whose idea is whose. Said McGuire in a tweet from 2017, 
Fanfic is awesome and amazing and I love it. And if you try to tell me about your fanfic, I will shut you down like a blockbuster video. Some authors have cited a 1992 incident involving author Marion Zimmer. She was initially very supportive of fandom and fanfiction in particular, but while writing a new novel, she realized that it touched on themes of a fanfiction she had already read. Bradley decided to scrap the novel altogether rather than risk a lawsuit. So where fanfic used to exist mostly in the underground, in the realm of pure hobbyism and sometimes in locked live journal communities out of fear of litigious authors, fanfiction's emergence into the mainstream has changed our relationship to it. Professional authors are fine admitting their past and sometimes present as fanfiction writers. It's no longer this shameful activity done in shadow, but an activity that is recognized as a valid way to improve your skills as a writer. As Neil Gaiman puts it, I think that all writing is useful for honing your writing skills. I think you get better as a writer by writing, and whether that means you are writing a singularly deep and moving novel about the pain or pleasure of modern existence, or you're writing a smeggle golem slash fic, you're still putting one damn word after another and learning as a writer. And that is my best Neil Gaiman impression. How did you know about my Smeagol Gollum slash Vic Neil Gaiman? <laughs> Cease and desist! <laughs>